Well, hello everyone and welcome to this Kendall Hunt webinar, Building Critical Thinking Skills in Anatomy and Physiology. How do you realistically provide a model for how students think about physiology, uh, which makes comprehensive content coverage, which realistically is impossible, much less important? That is what we're going to answer today. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded. You'll receive access to that in the coming days. Uh, the authors are also going to be making their PowerPoint presentation available to you as well, so you'll receive a link to that too. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout the webinar. Um, we will probably be addressing them at the end, so feel free to enter them in either the chat function or the Q&A um, at any point that you think of those. And before we get started, I'll just quickly introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have Eric Sildorf with us. He's currently Professor of Biology in the Department of Biological Sciences at Townsend University in Townsend, Maryland. As a postdoctoral fellow at both Penn State and the University of Maryland Medical Schools, Eric worked in the area of hormonal control, capillary blood flow, and the mammalian kidney. This work continued during following his appointment to an academic position at Townsend University in 1998 until... Following his love for teaching, he initiated the writing of a novel textbook in human physiology with his colleague and good friend, Gerald Robinson, who happens to be with us today. Broad teaching experiences in medical physiology, human physiology, comparative animal physiology, endocrinology, vertebrate anatomy, and molecular physiology greatly contributed to this passion. Gerald Robinson's graduate training on research interests lie in comparative animal physiology, specifically saltwater and balance in and aquatic and estrogen animals. He's published papers on optimal regulation in crabs, newts, frogs, diamondback terrapins, and sea snakes. The courses that he's taught as a faculty member at Fordham University and Townsend University include human anatomy and physiology, comparative animal physiology, advanced physiology, mammalian physiology, vertebrate anatomy, and osmoregulation. His philosophy is that students can learn to understand almost anything, given to a complete picture, a good explanation, and appropriate support. Well, I'm going to get out of the way now, and I'm going to let you guys uh, do your thing and present. We're really excited for uh, what you have to show us today. So thank you so much for being here with us. Great. Uh, thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're really excited to talk to you today and, and share some of our, our thinking on the pedagogy in human A&P. Um, just keep in mind, you, want, you get confused about which one of us is which. I'm the bald guy. Jerry's the other bald guy. Um, we have been working together for a long time and are really culminating our thoughts in sort of how to teach anatomy and physiology to engender those critical thinking skills. And so we want to share those ideas, a little bit of a methodology, and really we'll break this down into two main parts. Um, the first part will be sort of an introduction to the general ideas. And then the second part will be examples, uh, you know, physiological examples where we sort of demonstrate how to employ that, uh, the first part, essentially, the, the mechanisms of demonstrating how to engender some critical thinking skills. We Jerry, um, you jump in just with? want to make the comment that, that we are only going to show a few examples in the uh, time duration of this uh, webinar, but in your teaching, you can find these everywhere. So we would encourage you to think about that as you take what we present to you today and go into the future. All right. So what is critical thinking? So we've we've laid out a, a, a definition here uh, that we we sort of utilize for, in particular, uh, the teaching of anatomy and physiology. Certainly there's uh, a wide variety of ways people define critical thinking. We're gonna use this one, uh, the use of information, the parts, uh, and an understanding of the mechanistic framework um, at, that are a part, uh, a process essentially to predict outcomes. And so effectively what we're saying is critical thinking is the ability to reason, right? Given a, an intellectual framework, within which they can link information, then physiology becomes fairly intuitive. 
And the problem that students often have is that they don't see that, they don't see how things are tied together. They see it as a, a long laundry list of things to memorize in many cases. Now, we're going to essentially utilize two main mechanisms here of engendering critical thinking or setting the baseline for critical thinking to occur. One of those is, and these both focus on essentially on uh, demonstrating the why in physiology. And one of them is this term at the bottom here, uh, the adaptive purpose, which we'll define in a moment. So tying things to their evolutionary benefits. Uh, and then the other one will be the, the regular and continuous demonstration of causality in a lot of physiological function. And in a combination of using the two of those, we think we've come to a system where we more regularly regularly can create a framework within, within which the students can actually comprehend physiological function um, and anatomical components of that of those functional processes so that they can predict outcome, right? Because again, understanding and knowing a lot of facts about physiology is certainly important, but it's the utilization of those facts within a cognitive framework, how things work together. Uh, would it, it's so essential to their performance in a multitude of careers that they may, may be moving on to. I think sure. it's uh, contingent on us as instructors to try to help our students and encourage them to tie things together and look at things in context. It will help okay. them learn. In context enormously. is key. Yep. So what is this adaptive logic? We're, I, I sort of went searching a long time ago to see if anybody had used this term. And it, and it is a term, but it's in another field. I, I don't, I don't want to say we coined it. Um, but the idea behind it is that there's there's benefit in knowing how physiological functions or anatomical structures benefit the survival of the of the organism. organism. It provides a context for an understanding of why things exist, why they function the way they do. And that's not to say there aren't maladaptive traits, but in general, there's a lot of physiological function, anatomical structures that can be tied back to their adaptive benefits, which gives students a framework, right? They can they can then understand why certain things are occurring the way they're occurring or, or what purpose they might serve physiologically to, uh, you know, to enhance survival and, and, and improve performance. Um, and essentially, again, this is, this is provision of that context without which students really have a hard time, right? The, the content tends to sort of fall into this giant pool of factual, conceptual content that they can't tie together. And so we're trying to create ways for them to like link content together with an adaptive end goal. Um, we find that that really does benefit their, both their remembering things, but also their, their ability to sort of apply because there's an intuitive outcome to many physiolog physiological processes. If they understand why that benefit exists, then the steps to getting there uh, certainly start to make a lot more sense to them. And so, you know, teaching a course of, of this content requires both an explanation of the what, the how, right? How are things occurring and what steps are occurring, but also that essential why. Um, and the example we've we've got here, and we don't want to minimize the you know the what and the how. Those are they're certainly essential components. We're just saying that in many cases it's very difficult to uh, tie information together without rationale for the linkage of that information. And so I want to use an example here, and we'll give some more in, in an upcoming slide. Um, but the example being diffusion. Diffusion is is obviously often taught in physiology courses. It comes up in, in a variety uh, of contexts, um, but we think not enough and, and maybe not even in terms of adaptive benefit, right? I use the limitations of, it's not so much diffusion, but the limitations of diffusion as a way of explaining so many things. It explains the surface area of the lungs. It explains why squamous cells are flat explains why we have 50,000 miles of capillaries. 
and and on and on and on. There's just such an enormous variety of of physiological adaptations that rely on overcoming the limitations of diffusion. Excuse me. Um, and so utilizing these these examples just sort of gives that. I like to say a framework upon which students get to hang all the other details, right? That the what and the hows get hung on this idea of, you know, an adaptive, uh, I don't want to call it a purpose, but a benefit to many physiological functions and anatomical structures. Jerry, did you want to jump in at all? Yeah, I'm just thinking, uh, the comment I made earlier, diffusion is one example, but they're all over the place in physiology. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And again, I will come back to that idea that this is such a ubiquitous way of thinking for us now. And again, it's almost like I, I feel like I've found a solution to something and I'm just right. We're trying to share it um, because we're. it's just. There's so much teaching driven in many cases by what's found in textbooks. And in many cases, the textbooks don't have that as an emphasis. And so there's so, there's sometimes a gap there. And so we always felt that that was a gap that we were trying to fill so that the students would have context for the learning of the, you know, of the physiological content, anatomical content that we were trying to, we're all trying to teach them. So a couple more examples of this adaptive logic before we move on. Uh, I got a hemoglobin molecule in the upper right there, one of our examples, um, hemoglobin affinity fluctuations. I love using hemoglobin as one of these examples. Like you couldn't come up with a better example of a molecule that is that is adapted to its physiological function, right? It's multimeric, which allows cooperativity between the subunits, that allows this sort of adjusting adjusting of the affinity for oxygen, um, and it is in, it is entirely and intuitively intuitively tied to where we need oxygen to bind and where we need it to unload from that hemoglobin. Right, the affinity at the lungs is very high because of the microenvironment of the lungs. We're giving up carbon dioxide. The pH is rising. Those two tend to favor a higher affinity and loading. Bounce right back to the tissues, you know, 30 seconds later, and all of a sudden we have the exact opposite microenvironment that's favoring an unloading. So again, if they understand the, the tissue dynamics, the tissue characteristics, then all of a sudden what hemoglobin is doing becomes entirely intuitive. Um, another example here, the prolonged cardiomyocyte refractory periods. Many references say, oh, it's to avoid the, uh, the the possibility of wave summation and tetanus. And that may be true, but if you think about it, and my cardiomyocyte action potentials last about a quarter of a second. So we're talking about phenomenally high heart rates before that wave summation and tetanus could even occur. So to us, the so the adaptive logic here is the fact that these refractory periods make it impossible for uh, an action potential traveling around the the, car the cardiac uh, myocardium to actually re-enter an initial site, right? I can use a pen here to help us out for a second, right? If we have a, a, a sensitially linked group, a uh, bunch of tissue, right, by gap junctions, that signal can come in at one place and travel around in a circuitous fashion and come right back to the beginning. If we're not refractory when we get back here, it just keeps going, right? This is known as a re-entry arrhythmia, and it leads to often uh, potentially to ventricular fibrillation and, you know, obviously, obviously very detrimental outcomes. And so again, not having these long refractory periods would be highly detrimental, you know, in terms of uh, organism success and reproduction. Uh, Voltage-gated channels down here. Cells are horrible uh, electrical conductors, right? It, we refer to the cable properties, how they passively conduct electrical signals. Cells are terrible at it. Voltage-gated channels overcome the weakness of the cable properties of cells, allowing us to send electrical signals that travel much farther uh, along anatomical pathways. 
Um, again, back to those squamous cells, right? There's a there's an adaptive logic minimizing the diffusional distance that we mentioned previously, uh, increasing diffusive flux rates and allowing us to load and unload oxygen and and nutrients from from you know from the bloodstream to the tissues and and in a thousand other locations where um, minimizing diffusion is is critical. So quite a few of these, like this is just a tiny fraction of the places where you could come up with like the context, the adaptive context for physiological content and use that to create a framework within which your students can better understand this, this material. All right. So are students prepared for, criti for critical thinking learning strategies? Right, we've got our image over here with the, the cart in front of the horse. And we completely agree these are very useful and valid um, strategies to use in class. Um, they do employ critical thinking in many cases. Um, we don't wanna say that these are not good. What we're trying to say is, do the students have the essential skill set to effectively use these strategies to practice their critical thinking strategies? Right. I, I use the analogy of if the if the test is on riding a bicycle, right? That that would be the the critical thinking component uh, demonstration of critical thinking. But you haven't taught them how to steer or how to pedal or how to brake. Then they're really going to have a they're really going to have a hard time when you put them on the bicycle, right? So our strategies here are adapted to that sort of base skills they need to get on the bike and ride it, right? Teach them to to paddle, teach them to steer, teach them how to use the brakes before they get on the bike and have this potential to sort of crash and burn when you try to employ these critical you know thinking learning strategies and they have they just don't have the requisite skills yet. I think the, <clears throat> these are excellent examples of tools, like Eric said, uh, to help to develop further critical thinking skills. But they're basically not critical thinking itself. Critical thinking is simply looking at a situation, asking why. Why is what's happening happening? And then when, once you get your, your head around that, then think pair share, demonstrations, role playing, they're gonna happen much more effectively. Agreed. Okay, so isn't memorization okay? And we sort of have to define what we, where we mean utilizing memorization, right? There are certain, there's certain factual content that could only be memorized. In other words, there's not, uh, in other words, the name of a, a particular hormone, for instance, there's no tying that name to its function, um, outside of pure memorization. But beyond that, right, without going beyond that level of memorization and linking things causally causally or adaptively, um, then we're, we're not tying things together anymore. And so anything, you know, the, the content they're learning becomes what we call physiological trivia, right? They get very good at, at telling you what terms mean or, you know, that angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor but what's the purpose of angiotensin II physiologically, right? How does it fit into a framework that makes physiological sense in terms of, you know, an adaptive benefit? And so that's where we say, okay, we need to, memorization has its place, but then we need to move beyond. And that's one of that, that next step, I think, is law, uh, linking things causally. right? We want to avoid that just memorization and start linking things causally. And we all do this to a degree, and maybe we're just simply promoting the idea of doing it a whole heck of a lot more. Um, and the analogy I have down here are these, uh, you know, these dominoes where we're going to be um, linking ideas one to the next. And the problem becomes if if <laughs> students are missing a domino or two in a sequence, then all of a sudden they they can't make the logic jump. Right. And so you need to keep as many dominoes as needed in that linkage to make sure that they can follow it all the way through to a to a, a predictable and intuitive outcome. Um, why is why is this, you know, 
dependence on memorization so common? And there's probably a whole variety of reasons. Um, but one of them is just the, the magnitude of the content that we teach. There's just so much of it that students are just immediately thinking, okay, let me make a set of flashcards so that I can, you know, remember all this content. And our push here really is very broad, right? Bro we hope it's very broad reaching in terms of the pedagogy of this particular discipline and science in general, honestly. But that is that we need to push back on the idea that more is better, um, that teaching less much more effectively, linking things causally and adaptively, showing that adaptive significance uh, that allows them to think in context and apply information is just so much more important than understanding, you know, some of the minutia that really is not that it's not functional or important, but we can't teach it all, right? So we have to be selective. And then what we choose to teach, we have to make sure that we're providing that ability to think about it intellectually, be able to reason with it. And again, the whole idea here, you know, and examples of it is uh, down at the bottom here is the NCLEX and the MCAT are just really good examples of uh, particular groups sort of pushing back and saying, okay, you know, and, and sorry, I left people behind there a little bit. The NCLEX is the nursing licensure exam and the MCAT is the medical school admissions test. And both of them have changed in the last eight years, the nursing exam just this year to incorporate more <clears throat> critical thinking assessment on their exams. In other words, they're saying our, our folks, the people going into nursing or medicine, and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, into any career, Critical thinking, the ability to apply information is much more important than content knowledge. Um, and we're getting this pushback from the medical field saying, we want your students to be better at these things. Um, you, you know, medical malpractice uh, or medical accidents, I should say, probably, um, are, you know, a leading cause of death. And so being better able to think intuitively through these physiological and pathophysiological problems is a really important skill for them to learn. Maybe some of our viewers can relate to this, but I, I can tell you that years ago as a beginning faculty member, um, I was so intent on getting to all the, the items on the course syllabus that I was just almost like students. I, I was just overwhelmed with the details and I would go at, at a pace that would let me cover all that stuff and uh, my thinking evolved as time went on. It's really evolved since Eric and I have been working together. Uh, I would favor looking very selectively at the material that an instructor presents to a class and asking the question, is this detail necessary to understand the mechanism? Uh, and if not, maybe we should consider not presenting them and focusing instead on tying things together and getting students to think about how they apply and the implications of them. That's really what we're talking about here. And I think that's what uh, medical schools and nursing schools are now looking for. Yep. Yeah. And again, our, our motivation here is to say, okay, that we think that's important, but also to say, here's a mechanism that we've at least felt and found to be effective at doing that. And so that's, you know, that's part of the reason we're doing a webinar here and, and you know, some of our other activities, including a, a textbook. Um, okay. So let's get into some examples here. So I've got one here about uh, teaching the, the cardiac cycle um, and sort of in the absence of causality potentially, right? So hopefully most people are familiar with the Wiggers diagram. If you're not, it's just that giant stacked graph showing... Uh, the ECG, the pressure traces, the volume traces, and a whole variety of you know cardiac events. And it's very difficult for students to understand just because it's an enormous amount of material all at once, right? There's very few students that can look at it and go, oh yeah, totally makes sense, right? And so we as instructors have to lay it out uh, intuitively so that they can comprehend it. Now, you know, there are there are some published mechanisms of doing this, one of them involves uh, sort of presenting the cardiac cycle, then doing pressure flow relationships of that cycle. The, uh, some, one of the, uh, the 
physiological core principles is flow down uh, gradients. So that's certainly important. Uh, then covering the ventricular volume changes and then atrial and ventricular pressure changes, valve actions, and then lastly, the ECG. And in our thinking, these aren't necessarily ordered in a way that we would put them causally. In other words, the pressure changes are what initiate the volume changes. And the, so those should come prior. And then the ECG is actually a culmination of the electrical events of the heart, obviously, but it's essentially the, the demonstration of the stimulatory actions. And so this should go all the way at the beginning, right after our, the intro to the cardiac cycle. And so we would order these things a little bit differently than they're shown here. And so let me show you an example of how we might arrange that and, and walk a student through it. And again, I don't, my intent here is not to teach you cardiac physiology. Obviously you're, you're all doing this, uh, or many of you at least are probably already doing this, but my intent is to show you how we would show that causality so that students can sort of see what that giant graph is showing and break it down as opposed to it's a ton of information all at once and they have no idea how to, how it's linked uh, and you know what initiates you know what the causality is what causes you know how does a lead to b lead to c kind of thing I, I think we can all agree that the cardiac cycle is the thing that strikes the most fear into the hearts of students I saw that in the 37 years I taught physiology they were terrified and it, one of the reasons probably is it Again, if you take a look at the Wiggers diagram or even other presentations of this, it tends to be a lot of things happening all at once and they don't know how they're tied together. So let's take a look at our, our what we would like to call our intuitive version of the Wiggers diagram. And so I stack this the way I have it here um, so that I can draw my arrows, but I would actually start by, and so there's some introductory material that would have to occur, right? They would have to know about nodal versus cardiomyocyte action potentials. Um, they would have to know about the atrial and the ventricular syncytia, right, being separated by the fibrous skeleton, you know, the conducting system basics, but not a ton of information. Um, and then you could basically say, okay, so we would have an, sorry, I gotta move <clears throat> things around here. But you would have, and you could add it, you could say, okay, there's a nodal action potential, it would occur somewhere here, that would precede these atrial action potentials. And so, oh, I'm sorry, I need to change slides on this. So what I would say is that, okay, we have our primary stimulus from the nodal cells, but then our atrial cells all depolarize, right? And we're familiar with presenting this information, but what we need to then say is, okay, there's not one atrial cell, there's millions. And there's not one ventricular cell, there's tens or hundreds of millions. And so we, and again, once they understand the, the conducting system and the arrangement of the heart anatomically, then we could say, okay, the atrial action potentials would occur before the ventricular ones. So you line those action potentials up. Then you say, okay, well, when the atria are depolarizing, in other words, partially depolarized, yet not fully, again, and I'm showing that by showing three separate action potentials here overlapped. The one on the left here would be first, the one on the right would be last. And again, three, not three million or whatever the number would be. But when we're partially depolarized, we have a dipole, we have separation of charge in that atrial syncytia. That creates a voltage, that creates a wave. Poof, you have your P wave, atrial depolarization. Then you're fully depolarized. There is no difference, right, between the two ends of the atria and we have no dipole, so we're isoelectric. Then we repolarize the atria while we, we get into the ventricles through our, our AV bundle. And so we're gonna have, again, a dipole that's going to generate, and again, partially due to the atrial repolarization, but we get our QRS complex and so on, right? Again, when we're fully depolarized here, we're isoelectric. When we're repolarizing, we're not, and we get a wave again. We get our T wave. And so that allows us to go from action potentials, right, the stimuli for the contraction to the ECG, and then from those two down to our mechanical events, the pressure changes and the volume changes. And so then we could just say, okay, well, the plateau is calcium influx or partially calcium influx. Calcium is the stimulus for the contraction, 
So if I come down, that's when my atrial pressure will rise, right? The blue lines matching up there. When my ventricles are depolarized fully, then I'm going to start to generate ventricular pressure and I'm going to get that pressure spike, right? And of course, in between, we, you know, we lose those pressures when we're not depolarizing atria or ventricles. From there, we could, we could lay over our, our blood pressure trace, right? And of course, that pressure is going to spike when the ventricles contract because we're pushing more blood into that, that arterial circuit. And that's going to create the, the spike in our, our blood pressure, our systolic pressure here, and so on and so forth. So again, very intuitive. We can see any time, uh, if, if you think about a, a pressure gradient across a valve, uh, opening or closing it, depending on which pressure is higher, that's when, when traces cross over one another, right? So AV valves uh, close, the semilunar valves open, semilunars close, AVs open, right? From that, we go down to the bottom, which I always think of as sort of like the culmination of the whole thing, which is the ventricular volume trace. Well, look at our look at our pressure traces here. If atrial pressure exceeds ventricular pressure, and they know the anatomical reference here, we've got an AV valve in between. Well, if the atrial pressure is higher, that AV valve is open. We're filling. So here's passive filling. When the atria contract, that's we're going to fill more, right? So that's going to be active filling. Then the ventricles start to contract and our, our valve closes. Oh, we just became isovolumic. Then our semilunar opens, right? Now we have an opening from the ventricle into the arteries. And so, of course, we can now lose volume, right? That's going to be our ejection phase as the volume is falling here. We then uh, start to lose pressure as the ventricles repolarize. Pressure falls below the arterial pressure, that semilunar closes, and we become isovolumic again. Until the point at which that ventricular pressure falls below atrial, and once again, that AV valve opens, and we're back to passive filling. We could throw in our heart sounds down here at the bottom with the sort of the logical correlations with the valve actions and the turbulent flow associated with them. But the idea here is that Ideally, you can provide, once they've got the ACH potentials, you could provide, and, and, and this or sequenced, right? In other words, start with this and start with this. Oop, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, my pen going crazy. Wow, sorry about that. Whoa, technical difficulties. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but the idea here is that if you give them these sequence ACH potentials, everything else can be derived. They're no longer trying to sort of memorize this giant stack diagram of physiological content, which they're not tying together anyway, right? Whereas if they derive the ECG from the ACH potentials, then you could say, like, what's, what's the mechanical event occurring during the PR segment? And they should be able to infer it. Right? All of these things become fall now into this ability to, or this category of, of being able to think about them and apply the context uh, provided by, you know, generating this Wiggers diagram themselves. So it's a lot. In other words, it's a, it takes a lot of time words, in class, but it's a very effective tool. Sorry, Jerry. I was just, just going to say, in other words, by showing things in a logical fashion, almost like a domino effect, one leading to the next. It's possible to take something that's very difficult and make it understandable for your students. And that's really what this is all about, tying things together, seeing them in context, everything uh, everything making good sense. Yep, yep. And sorry about the crazy pen there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, another example, lacking linkage, right? So in this one, we're going to talk a little bit about how blood volume affects blood pressure. And this is a really good example. And there's, a, there's just a, tons of them, but a really good example of those, of lining up the dominoes so that students can really see the causality. Like, how do you get from A to Z? And you can't get a student from A to Z by giving them A, M, and Z, right? So essentially it's, it sounds like it's more content, but what it is is more explanation. 
And with that explanation comes an ability to then think about the, the physiological context and predict outcomes and a whole variety of other things that are really essential skills. Uh, so the example we have here is in a textbook, if the blood volume increases, blood pressure increases. That seems intuitive. Uh, it, this is then supported by an analogy about water in a balloon. More water would equal more pressure. And I think everyone, the students would agree that that makes perfect sense. It's intuitive. It's not inaccurate. What it is, is insufficient. In other words, to be more effective, we need to give them the rest of the dominoes. Because, again, just thinking about this, it's blood You, If you add volume to a person, right, you give them an IV infusion, the huge majority of that volume does not end up in the arterial circuit. So the analogy with the balloon kind of falls apart a little bit. But so filling the venous component, the, the high compliance component of the circuit actually alters what's happening on the other side of the circuit in the arterial circuit. And it's a it's without that linkage, the ability to think about how changing preload or how changing venous compliance or a whole variety of other things becomes impossible. They can't think about it at all. They're just left with more volume means higher pressure period. So let's walk you through a little bit, you know, several more of the dominoes here, a lot more of the dominoes. And again, your, your picture with dominoes may, you know, you may put in other dominoes. You might have to add up more dominoes. Um, but what we would start with, and I'll put this down here at the bottom, we've got a picture of a heart, very simplistically. This is our sort of 30,000 foot view of blood pressure regulation, right? Blood pressure is proportional to blood volume in those arteries, right? And again, there's, there's back to the balloon, right? That's intuitive, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Now, in our model here, our 30,000 foot view of blood pressure, the blood volume in the arterial circuit is proportional to two things and two things only, inflow, cardiac output, and runoff determined by peripheral resistance, constriction or dilation of arterioles. If there's more inflow than outflow, volume and pressure rise. If there's more outflow than inflow, volume and pressure fall. Easy peasy. Now, how are we tying blood volume to blood pressure? Besides just saying, well, if it goes up, your balloon is more full and there's greater pressure on the walls. That's where we have to take this increase in blood volume and tie it to the dominoes. We have to say, okay, there are vessels that give a lot and there are vessels that don't give a lot in our, in our cardi cardiovascular circuit. The veins give a lot, okay? So that's where most of that volume ends up. And our, our central venous pressure rises a little bit, right? They do give a lot, there's high compliance, but they, the pressure there rises initially because that's where the volume goes initially. That's going to increase uh, gradients drive flux, right? We present that as a physiological core concept. A higher pressure in the veins, if we maintain our, our diastolic heart pressure, we just increases, increased our venous return to the heart, which means our end diastolic volume falls up, fall, or sorry, goes up, right? Our filling goes up, our preload. Frank Starling law of the heart, right? You could add as much detail to this as you'd like. Um, but that increased filling generates a harder contraction and increases our output, our mm. stroke volume. So we're going to end with more cardiac output to the lungs. And then this thing, the same mechanism occurs on the opposite side, right? So now that's coming back to the left heart. Increases the, the end diastolic volume on that side of the heart. Increased stroke volume, increased cardiac output. Our arterial volume goes up and our blood pressure goes up. So we've now added the dominoes such that we don't lose them along the way, hopefully. And again, you can add more dominoes if you need to. And they need some core principles, right? Gradients drive flux kind of principles, like not too difficult. But then it becomes a cognitive framework within which they can understand a whole lot of other things. They were, things we're not talking about here that are you know, also shown in this figure, right? We start changing some of these other parameters they're all tied to changes in input versus output, right? Which we said with our very simplistic model down here is our driver of, our determinant of blood pressure over time. 
right? Again, I, predictability is the key here. Without the it, logic, they can't do that. I think it'd be very reasonable for a physiology instructor to look at this diagram and say, well, I don't know if I have time to show this to my students. And we would argue that maybe it's necessary to make time for this because like Eric was just saying, it shows everything in context, it shows the domino effect, but most importantly, it uh, it's an opportunity to apply critical thinking. Like if you perturb any of these different avenues on the flow diagram, blood pressure is gonna be affected. And ultimately we want our students to understand why. So do we have time to show this type of thing? Yes, we do. If we trim back or focusing on uh, trivial detail. You know, if you have the, the, the choice between showing your students something like this and uh, details about anything, you know, that are basically just gonna get memorized, we'd encourage you to think about this instead and present this to your students. Yep, agreed. And one thing I would point out too is that I students do easily get overwhelmed when you show them a, a lot at once. But because this is an intuitive linkage of events here, right, dominoes falling, it, it becomes something that's easy to present stepwise for the instructor, I think, right? You don't have to say, oh my God, I have to start with this on a, on a slide so I have it all and I don't forget anything. Because it's an intuitive story where you won't forget things because you've learned the logic of it. And all you're doing is conveying that same, you know, domino falling logic to your students. And so then they you're building the framework one step at a time, as opposed to like, here's 47 dominoes and let's go explain as I am here, of course. Uh, let me explain why one is linked to two and two is linked to three. Right. You see this a lot when another example I always bring up is, is neurophys and, you know, act potentials, graded potentials, act potentials, neurotransmitter release. And students will sometimes list those events out of order. Right. You'll ask them like, well, what comes after blank? And they'll list something that is literally impossible. Right. In other words, they have not learned. How the events are are causally linked. And so their application skills, of course, are zero because they can't think about it because they don't even have the lo the logical linkage of these events occurring sequentially. And so that's why I think this causality is a really big one too, right? It's it's this it what's it's what allows the students to link things within a an intellectual framework that they can then sort of they've got their brains wrapped around it so that they can think about it. They can apply perturbations, which is the goal, right? It's the, that's what the clinical people are pushing back on us and saying, you know, it's not just memorization of the content. It's like, how does, how do these mechanisms change if all of a sudden I change, you know, venous return or I change, you know, total peripheral resistance, right? What happens? And if they understand a 30,000 foot view of blood pressure, it's really, right, these, you know, what any hormone that's vasoconstrictive does is truly intuitive and simplistic, right? Why the kidney retains water and how that affects blood pressure, completely intuitive, right? Decrease urine volume, increase blood volume, increase uh, central venous pressure, increase venous return, increase EDV. It's a lot of steps, but they're, they're logically linked steps. I get my students sort of reciting these and they're saying it like they're and not memorize, not from memory, but like they're reciting these steps because they're intuitive, intuitively linked. That's the key. Okay, uh, a last a last example here. Um, and again, this is just we'll, we'll be fast on this one. But again, this is just tying together, linking uh causally related events so that students have a way to remember them, right? There's a reason that social security numbers have hyphens in them. The content is grouped. It's hard to, right? It's called mental chunking where things are sort of linked together. Here we're linking them together, not just in groups, but, but logically and functionally. Uh, and so in, in sort of talking about um, nephron function, you know, we would have to explain all of these different parameters, right, to move things in and out of nephrons. Well, we want to explain how 
a nephron functions, and then we can just add bells and whistles as we, as we move down the nephron, right? But if we look at the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, we can lay out uh, some sequential events for you that, that sort of make sense in order. And so here we have a nephron wall. And so what we're doing is saying, okay, well, let's start with sodium potassium pump. Every cell's got one, right? Thousands of them. And so we've now created a gradient, uh, a chemical gradient for sodium. Well, now step two is sodium would leave the tubular fluid and enter the cell. Okay, we've just reabsorbed sodium. That's going to leave behind a higher concentration of anions. Here they are. So we're going to get a charge repulsion that's going to drive them largely paracellularly to be reabsorbed. Oh, we're now reabsorbing sodium and chloride and other anions. Okay, now we re reabsorbed a lot of sodium and a lot of chloride. Guess what? Now we're in a scenario where we just removed a lot of the solute content from this fluid, but we haven't removed the water component. So we're osmotically going to drive water reabsorption. Here it comes. After that, we're going to just start to concentrate everything else that was left behind. And so many of those things, including what we would consider some waste products, might be reabsorbed. And again, our paracellular junctions here will determine you know, to a degree what can leave and what can't. Um, but now we're, you know, we, we've sort of completed our, our reabsorption in this case. And the last step is simply the uptake into the capillaries. And then we would talk about capillary flux and what drives uptake reabsorption to dominate over, uh, you know, the opposite filtration here. And, you know, that becomes an intuitive, uh, you know, logic based explanation. Right. If the if the uh, osmotic pressure of blood, the plasma is high and the hydrostatic pressure is low, we favor reabsorption. And so, again, would these would all these events be occurring simultaneously? Sure, they would. But if we teach them sequential and relate that, but if we teach them sequentially, now we've got a cognitive framework within which they understand why each of them is occurring, as opposed to just memorizing that you know this is being reabsorbed or that's being you know, secreted kind of thing. Here and then, can... you know, just keep adding details, right? We could just say, oh, you know, we want to reabsorb glucose. Well, add transporters for glucose and use the sodium gradient, right? It, it becomes a lot easier once you have the framework in place. Here's an excellent opportunity to interject some uh, critical thinking into the class. Let's say you've walked through these mechanisms with your students. Uh, there's a drug, it's a uh, cardiac glycoside called Wabing or Stefanton G that specifically blocks action of the sodium potassium pump. So after you've explained everything that Eric just went through, you can say, listen, here's Wabing. This is what it does. It blocks the sodium potassium pump. What happens to the mechanisms that we just went through if that drug's present? You have an opportunity to think about it. Do the think pair share if you want to or whatever. But ultimately, they should come to the conclusion that everything is shot down. They just had an opportunity to exercise some critical thinking skills. We want, we want students to use this type of thinking in everything they do in physiology. Absolutely. Okay, let me wrap it up. So we've created a template for sort of engendering these critical thinking skills. Um, down, jumping to the bottom for a second, we do have a paper coming out very soon. I was hoping we'd have links already, but um, that lay this out in greater detail um, with examples, uh, a specific example actually. Um, but it summarizes these steps of identifying the what is it you're going to teach. Make sure that we're identifying that adaptive significance. In other words, if we don't explain the why, it becomes hard for under students to understand context. We can order many physiological processes using a timeline. For instance, in the nephron there or the blood volume changes, right? Uh, many organ systems have a pathway that we can follow anatomically uh, that gives us a framework for explaining things in a sequence. 
And then it's building those, those cognitive frameworks, right? The Using the causal sequencing, the causal linkages to make sure that students understand why things are occurring in the sequence they're occurring. Uh, and then finally, we want to be able to test them, basically apply those frameworks by, you know, inducing perturbations. Jerry just gave an example uh, or physiological ones. Um, you know, exercise is one that comes up over and over again in a variety of, of, of areas in physiology. But those perturbations really allow them to employ their understanding of the, the their cognitive framework, their, the understanding of the system, what it's doing and why it's doing it. Uh, and also to understand the regulation that must be in place for the system to modify activity to meet needs. And so really, again, we're really trying to sort of shift, we hope, the pedagogical approach to a lot of A&P, right? There's just so much content that it's easy to become overwhelmed with it. And we think there's something more important than more content. We think sort of conveying that that causality and physiology really is what we need. We need it in, you know, you need it in your car mechanic, you need it in your, your physician, <laughs> right? It's just a universal skill that we think applies pretty much everywhere. Uh, no one is hired for the amount of facts they know uh, or, or they don't keep a job because of that, right? Uh, People are hired and are successful because of their the ability to apply information to think given a framework. Uh, and we think, you know, we need to help students get that skill level to begin practicing that critical thinking. So as a group, we're at this crossroads, right, in the teaching of physiology. And so we're asking, which way do you want to go? So we're trying to, again, we're... We wrote a textbook with the purpose of providing the tools to do what we're proposing. Um, and now we're just out there saying, okay, the, the book's done, but now we're we're trying to say, well, how do you use the tool, right? That's what we're really trying to, to help people with. And because, you know, it's easy to be overwhelmed, not only as a student, but as an instructor as well. We, Jerry and I were, you know, as well, when we started doing this, um, with the amount of content and how do you teach it? And so we're just trying to give people a, a mechanism of, of maybe modifying what you, what you do uh, in the hopes of engendering more critical thinking skills. All good, Jerry? That's it. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. We actually have some, some questions here in the Q&A, quite a few actually. Um, and so someone says, um, I teach an A&P eight weeks class, really more like over seven and a half weeks. It's hard for students to focus on critical thinking, the hows and the whys. Mostly they're regurgitating information either from chat GPT or the internet. I see their knowledge gap in the Zoom sessions. They can explain muscle contraction without knowing the role of the calcium ion. So what are your thoughts on fast paced courses? How do you emphasize critical concepts in these sorts of classes? Yeah, that's a that's a battle, and I've and I've been there, done that. Uh, we have summer courses here that I've taught many years that are five weeks, five weeks of A and P, like a, a full course, fifteen weeks jammed into five. So I feel your pain. Um, again, I think it comes down to that initial prioritization. Like everything needs to be taught, I in my opinion, where they're seeing the the rationale for your teaching it and. And again, I I spend time in a first class conveying why I teach the way I teach, right? So that they and it, I get strong buy-in, like they they see that developing critical thinking skills are important. Um, and then I have to tell them how to do it, right? You have to tell them how to study. And so I think in a really rapid paced class, I mean, one of the things you have to remember is just that it's better to have them learn some content really well than a whole ton of stuff, factual content, really poorly. In other words, just memorizing steps. I, I call that sort of this, you know, courses that are that are set up as as hoop jumping. It's like, oh, I got a B in in A and P, and all you did was have, you know, all the student did was jump through these sort of hoops. They didn't actually learn. They just memorized what they had to memorize. You know, they learned how to give you the answer that you were looking for. They didn't generate a, you know, develop an understanding of physiology. 
And so I get it. That's a that's a tough one, right? Moving fast is a challenge, but I would still say you have to focus on good example, the blood pressure one, right? Blood pressure is hugely complex, blood pressure regulation, hugely complex, right? Multitudes of hormones, you know, autonomic nervous system, the heart, the blood vessels, the kidneys. It all funnels down into input relative to output. Everything else will funnel into that. So if you create those frameworks ahead of time, and then everything kind of falls into a bucket, right? Like, oh, increases volume, increases venous return, critic output. Vasoconstriction, limit output from the arterial circuit, right? Output from that system, right? Critic output input. So I think that, you know, it, it does take some thinking, um, but I think it's doable. It's a challenge though. Our, our next question actually kind of, I think, piggybacks off of that really nicely. Um, for physiologically complex concepts, how does one prioritize what to cover to ensure the critical thinking? I do like covering material logically and building from basics to application from a clinical standpoint, but it does take significant class time. In other words, how do we choose what to sacrifice? Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> Jerry, you want to jump in on that? I see you shaking your head. Okay. Well, Eric and I have had a standing joke over the years. I, the amount of material on the syllabus that I actually got through by the end of the semester went down. I mean, as far as like the items that were listed, it's because I was uh, I was sort of sharpening my ability to get students to think about what was happening. And I became so interested and so committed to that. If there were, uh, if there were aspects of like uh, reproductive physiology that I didn't get to, I felt bad about it. But the fact is, I still thought the students were taking away from the course something they could really use in the future. Uh, there's sort of a trend or a pattern to the way things happen in physiology. And I would advocate spending enough time to help students see that pattern so that down the road, when they confront things that are novel, they have the tools, as Eric says, to deal with that. I mean, the, the explosion of knowledge in physiology is just amazing. We can't teach everything. We can't learn everything. What we can do is develop skills to help us to deal with that. Let me just jump on that one real quick, uh, piggyback on that answer. One of the things I would say in terms of like, what do you what do you choose to cut? I would say if you can't explain why you're teaching something, in other words, if it doesn't fit into a framework, if it does, if it's not essential to the explanation of the, it's not an essential domino, right? Then you, then I would say you can leave it out, right? Because again, we always, we're always looking like you can't do it all. What do I leave behind, right? And so, you know, if I don't mention some, you know, minor player in blood pressure regulation, that's okay because I've explained the the system of blood pressure regulation, whereby they hear about it later on. It's like, oh, well, that fits right into this model I already understand, right? And so, but I get it. You, you've got to wait. You know, but I would just say that there's that there's that question you have to ask yourself is, is this critical to an understanding of the whole system? If it's not, then you might decide to leave it out just in the name of time. Eric and I are not saying this is easy. Uh, teaching physiology is hard. Uh, but the fact is uh, every instructor has the responsibility of determining what material is going to be presented to the students. And uh, yeah, for sure, part of physiology, part of any discipline is the language that has to be spoken so that you can communicate about the discipline. Uh, that's true. But what we want to do is take every opportunity available to us to get students to think about these mechanisms, why they work, how they work, and how, if they're perturbed, that's going to affect the whole scheme. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shay is an associate nursing degree instructor, and uh, she works really hard to um, help students apply knowledge effectively in various disease scenarios. Um, she says, one approach I currently employ is to encourage students to articulate their thought process by asking questions such as, what is happening with the patient that is giving rise to this particular system? 
So is this what you guys mean by adaptive logic? And do you have additional suggestions to foster critical thinking about physiologic concepts in a real-time clinical setting? Yeah, for sure. Like like the, the pathological uh, examples are phenomenal. Like I use, I don't teach pathophys, but I use pathophysiological examples as a way to, like I use it rather than pointing to the importance of that, but as a way to point out the importance of the physiological function, right? In other words, showing when something doesn't work often points out why it's so important, right? People with hypertension have a problem with, you know, sympathetic output or renal function or whatever. And it's like all of a sudden you could start to tie it back logically to that understanding of, you know, blood pressure regulation or whatever it might be. So yeah, I would say that that's that that's spot on, you know, in terms of one of the mechanisms that we think is is very viable. But again, they can't. And again, I don't want to go into the weeds here too far. But evolutionary uh, medicine, right, is the is using this sort of like adaptive purpose, uh, you know, adaptive benefit of something. Uh, and but looking at dysfunction, like dysfunctional traits, we're just saying we're utilizing to, to, to show uh, physiological traits, right? In other words, the benefit of uh, certain traits as opposed to when traits are maladaptive for some reason or another. Um, but yeah, I think that's, it's all about the cognitive framework. If they don't have a framework with upon which to base their thinking, then they don't think, right? If you don't understand how the parts of a car engine are put together and how each part contributes to the functioning of the next, you, you have no predictive ability when something goes wrong. That's why I say this critical thinking applies everywhere. Like I want my auto mechanic to have critical thinking skills, right? Because they will be able to better diagnose what's going on. And so I think you're, you know, the, the clinical instructors that are here are just in that situation where they're saying, okay, we're dealing with that exactly, right? We're dealing with things went wrong. How do we know, how do we backtrack? It's like, you're kind of going backwards through the dominoes, right? Figuring out which domino, you know, is, is dysfunctional to figure out what the, you know, pathological condition is that led to the outcome. It's just backtracking. We're saying, in other words, we're using it forward in physiology. <clears throat> In pathophys, you're taking an outcome and working backwards. But I think it's the, the same model applies, right? Would be my point is I think the same model works depending irrespective of which end of the equation you start on. I know we're running out of time here, but uh, just wanted to throw a different, slightly different angle on this. I used to get a laugh out of my classes when I told them I really like drugs. And uh, the reason I liked them, and I told them they were going to hear a lot about drugs from me. Uh, you can use drugs, pharmaceuticals, that perturb various aspects of the systems that we study. And you can get students to think critically by saying, okay, what if we apply this particular agent that blocks this or stimulates this? What is the effect going to be? on the overall system. Students love that. And all we're really doing is again, capitalizing on the idea of critical thinking, encouraging people to put the why, the how into place. Absolutely. Okay, I think I'll grab one more of these questions here. And then um, if you have additional questions, I'm sure the audience would love for you to reach out um, to them and ask. But um, let's see, Nicole asks, how can you adjust this for large classrooms? I regularly teach between 150 and 240 students in a single lecture hall. Yep, I've been there. Um, I, you know, the, the presentations are the the same for me it's sort of like how do you engage the class is is different i think um because you know students in a big class there's a group that find it easy to hide right and so they they avoid your um your prodding and you know that 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 student faculty interaction that i sort of feel is essential to them moving ahead one of the things i would i would 
I try to uh, push in my really large classes is forming study groups, mm. right? It's like they, so that they, and again, I teach the, the whole learning pyramid bit and like there's active learning and passive learning and, and the effectiveness of those, you know, techniques. And there's, you know, there, there's always a group that doesn't want to, you know, they're, they're reticent, but there's another group that buys in and it's, it, it helps in those really big classes because what they can't sometimes do, you can't do with 150 or 200 or more students. Sometimes they can like, they can work those problems out on their own in groups. And then they, you know, then they can bring their, their outcomes, their questions that came up uh, to you. So Again, I, it is a challenge, um, but I would say that the presentation style really isn't modified for me. I do the same thing. Does it create more questions? Probably, right? It, if you tell somebody, somebody a fact, they're either going to believe you or not. Our students are writing down everything we say. Whereas if you explain something and it doesn't make sense to them, it often, you know, formulates a question in their heads. Um, but again, I would I would promote that as well, is that our our quote unquote lectures should be more discussion than lecture. Um, and it does that limit your content that you might cover? It sure might. But again, if it gets them to a better place in terms of their, you know, their context, contextual understanding and their ability to apply, then it's worth it. Right. And that would, you know, it's almost like the take home message for me is that. I think we're pushing for backing off on content where you can and taking that extra and putting it into this development of critical thinking skills that are so needed and desired again by many of the professional fields. I think it's just, it's worth, it's a worthy endeavor. And if it means changing what you're doing a little bit, it's, it's worth it. It's teaching is so much more fun this way, infinitely more fun when you're telling a logical story and the players all have interactions that make perfect sense. And again, maybe not to them immediately, but you know, they learn the the logic and the outcome of the story makes good sense, you know, by the time they get to the end. I think we can lean <clears throat> lean on the internet also to help with this. Uh, at Towson we have Blackboard. And that's a uh, that's a venue where you can communicate with your students outside the actual lecture hall. I used to routinely uh, pose thought questions and that type of thing on Blackboard. Give the students an opportunity to kind of wrestle with that. And I think we could set up uh, study groups as well. Is that right, Eric? We, yeah, we there so are mechanisms can. doing that. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, just like we're using the internet today for this webinar, that's a tool that really expands your ability to communicate. Well, and one last thought there. Sorry, Megan, we're we're always long winded. Um, but another option too is to is a flipped classroom, which might be scary to some people. But the idea of posting all your lectures ahead of time, you know, making sure students are watching them, and then your class time because you it opens up your class time for all of this like questions and analysis and like can you apply the models that I was trying to convey in these lectures kind of thing right then you're just beating through the details as opposed to presenting the details it's almost like okay put the class time that you know their learning time for the lecture content on them and make your class time much more effective at sort of instilling those those critical thinking uh skills that are so important absolutely well, I want to thank you guys again so much for, for your time today and for coming and presenting this for us. It was really fascinating, um, and we have a lot of great feedback already. So thank you also, everyone um, who attended today uh, for your time and just for your investment in your students um, and your dedication to teaching quality material and making sure that your students are really, really learning. Um, like I said, this recording is going to be sent to you in the coming days, as well as the PowerPoint presentations. And we will also um, hook you guys up with access to um, the author's book if you would like to see that as well. Um, and in the meantime, we hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again.